Amen. Good to see all of y'all today. And if you don't mind, I'd like to speak a little bit about the return of Christ. We don't hear a lot about Jesus' return. We hear a lot of sensationalism and you all know the stories. Most of you have either been part of it, supporting it, contributing to it, or playing with it. But it's just a lot of sensationalism out there. It's called preoccupation. Jesus taught us His church, this ecclesia, under His reign, His kingship directly and immediately, under His shepherdship as His flock immediately and directly, under His headship as His body immediately and directly. He taught us to occupy until He comes. And you notice all the energy and all the money with preoccupations because it serves the interest of those who want disciples for themselves. We're called in the Great Commission to disciple all the nations. And that's in relationship to Christ's interest. You'd say, well, Brother Carter, isn't that obvious? Well, you have to remember, uh, ecclesias are quite unique. They're very exclusive, very unique, nothing to compare with the ecclesia. That's why it's so despised, so rejected among people, because just as they despised, belittled, and rejected Jesus, the head of the ecclesia, they despise anything limited and defined by Christ as the Bible defines and limits the ecclesia as Christ. So if you've ever heard anything said less than Christ about the ecclesia landmark particularly, they were saying something other than what the Bible says. And it wasn't between you and them. It was between them and Christ that they wished to so mar His visage that you wouldn't even recognize the glory and the character and the love and the grace and the truth and the kindness uh, in the ecclesia. In Luke 7, 29, it says, All the people that heard Him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. Luke 7, 30 said, But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of Him. So, what does Occupy look like? Well, it looked like declaring God right, which is what we do when we're baptized. At that time, John was preaching that the kingship of God was at hand. It's here now. That self-disclosed expression of the monarchical reign of God as revealed in the person Christ Jesus. And he said, it's here at hand. He himself said that I would not have known who he was, but I baptized with water to make him manifest to Israel. But I would not have known who he was until the Holy Spirit in the form of the dove descended. And then he knew that this is the one that by baptizing him, he would make him manifest. Remember, he told Jesus that I need to be baptized of you and yet you come to me. And he said, suffer it to be so, for it's necessary for us, speaking of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to fulfill all righteousness. And John proceeded. And the Father said from heaven, this is my beloved Son. Listen to Him, beloved, referring to His endearment to His Father and His absolute obedience, remaining under the voice of His Father until a kind of death, even the kind of death called the cross. Debasing Himself to the form of a bond slave, the lowest social status. So now we get the implication is, is that these people weren't about to acknowledge the self-disclosed expression of the monarchical reign of God, that the king would be here and he would have his subjects and he would be reigning over them. Luke 19 says that there are those who do not desire Jesus to reign over them. Well, it's hard to commit atrocities against our fellow man and dishonor God in whose image our fellow man is created if we have Jesus as our king. Because for many people, when he comes back bodily and returns, and he will soon, then he sets up his earthly reign. It'll be disorienting for them. Now, for us in the ecclesia, it's quite correlative, is it not? We should say, hey, I'm very accustomed to this. I'm very accustomed in my home as me, the head of the house, the husband, to lay down my life for the interest of my wife. I'm very accustomed to my wife following me like Christ, the church follows Christ Jesus. I'm very accustomed to telling my children that my nurture and admonition is all in the Lord and I teach them and I'm very honored when they, what, submit to the instruction and authority of both parents in a house that is reflecting that. And you would come to the assembly and you would present your children to the Lord's table, your family, your wife as a head of your house. You would come to the Lord's house in the ecclesia and you would come here in reverence and honor of the one that receives the glory by Christ Jesus in the ecclesia. Of course, that type of character, you know, does not find itself so common out there. The domestically disturbed wish the ecclesia to be disturbed as well. 
uh, those that have no fear and reverence of God have no interest in the one who's returning because they don't have interest in him who's here reigning spiritually right now. So to say, I am looking forward to the return of Jesus bodily, but I have nullified his relevance spiritually is a complete contradiction. And only those of us who know what it is to have Christ reign over us, word, contact word, upon us, know the difference. And it's so glaringly apparent, is it not? <laughs> I mean, these people have no interest in this king who is kind and gracious and merciful, who went about doing good, doing wonderful things, the Bible said. But it said they nullified God's counsel. That's the determinate counsel of God unto themselves. They didn't deter nullify God's plan. This word is also plan or God's intention for baptism. The intention for baptism is still the same, that God be declared right. So when we come out, it's like our own exodus. You, will. you remember they were standing there asking John, now that we're baptized, what? So he told the soldiers not to coerce people to use their position as a soldier for honorable things. You remember it says if someone coerces you to go a mile, go too. But who would be coercing you except men who would take their position and receive monies to go and abuse other people? Then the others said, well, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, what about us? Uh, what should we do? He said, well, if you have an extra coat, remember in the covenant community, they're all related. So you wouldn't be without a coat because you have a brother that has an extra coat. He would give that. You wouldn't be without food because you have a brother with extra food. He would give that. That's why the account of Lazarus cast out at the rich man's gate was quite a contradiction. But it did show the extreme, the far remote distance that could occur in a covenant community between those who were there to diminish the return on another person's participation in it. Don't you love that? People literally give their lives to diminish the return on your investment in serving Christ to assure that you get no return for all your efforts. It's called futility. And they want to futilize. We learned that's the character trait in Egyptianity. The Pharaoh said, who is God that I should obey him? And who are these people that you're asking me to let go? So what he said, well, I'll show you what I'll do. I'll just exasperate them, futilize them. I'll double the tally and I'll remove the straw. Don't you love that? Coming or going, they couldn't win. It's called futility. That's why Jesus himself said, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. Amen. I'll give you rest. Push the pause button because you're jumping hurdles and going through hoops and these religious people just do not care how futile it is for you to serve Christ, live your life according to the terms of the covenant community because these people are teaching you a lesson that we will not allow you to have a return on that investment of your time or energy. Don't you just love the devil's people? How do they learn all this stuff? How, where do they get it? Well, they ask the same thing about us. How do these people know how to live such godly lives? How do these people know how to be so kind and gracious? How do these people know how to edify and build up people when we're over here with just naturally tearing them down, tripping them. We're just with ease propping up another hurdle and thinking, oh, you just think you could jump that hurdle. We'll raise it next week. Don't you love that? When you finally learn how to play the obstacle course and you can navigate through it, you know, you look like one of them ninjas on TV that a show they had where they would go do all these weird things. I thought my little grandson could do better than that. But you finally get where you can do it. Finally, you can be jump through the hoop and no one told you except Jesus. Oh, I don't ask sheep to jump through hoops. I don't call people unto me to be exasperated. Oh, I didn't ask people to invent a gospel that's about baptism. I have a baptism that's about the gospel. It's about the good news. It's about his death, about his burial, about his resurrection. Matter of fact, in the book of Galatians, we're told that we believe into Jesus and as many of us as were baptized into Jesus, that is the ecclesia, so have put on Christ in this lifetime. How else would we identify in any manner whatsoever with the shepherd except to don the wool of a sheep? Remember old Saul of Tarsus? He was loitering. He was hesitating to be baptized. You remember that? You know why? He was the chief of the persecutors. And if you were one of the ones who were heading the wolf pack, you know exactly what was waiting because you remember he took those dear people, husbands and wives, brothers and sisters in the covenant community of God. He said, I'll teach you to follow the way. I'll teach you to love the life. I'll teach you what it costs to receive the spirit of the truth and to love the truth and to serve the truth and to go out and give this truth to other people. I will teach you by placing you in shackles and we'll parade you into the city and we will also put you to the point where you will blaspheme him uh, to the point of death. Way to go, Saul. Like uh, 
the pathological antagonist of the Old Testament, Amalek. I forgot his name one day in a sermon. Those of you that helped me, I call him Abimelech. He's Amalek. He's a pathological antagonist. And I've had people ask me, where do you learn all this? I said, did you not read your Bible where people had no rationale for what they were doing to God's people except that's what they do? Religion's irrational. They have no idea why they're obsessed with exasperating people who are here as salt of the earth and lie of the world. They have no idea why they're doing it. And you can't not expect them to have known because in the Bible it's a judgment against them to be turned over to an unworthy mind because they considered it... That is, they consider retaining the full knowledge of God in their minds an unworthy thing. So God turned them over to an unworthy mind. God released the reins. I'm no longer restraining that person. And don't worry, He didn't do that so they'd be a problem for us. All you have to do is just let them know, as we've done here, just turn on a little light. It doesn't take a lot of light. It's like a holy water to a vampire in them picture shows. Y'all ever seen that? You turn on the light of truth, my, you just quote one or two scriptures and they're out of here. They can't take it. So with what are we to be occupied? Until He comes. And what have you been occupied? With what have you been occupied? It's a good question, isn't it? They've been building up. A dear late pastor named uh, Adrian Rogers out just a few miles up here at Memphis. He was talking about once in one of his messages about there's, everybody's building in the building program. and He said they're tearing down or they're building up. I thought that was the funniest thing, but who wants to be around those people tearing down? What kind of skill sets for that? There's not. Have you noticed? They have nothing to say. Nothing to contribute. They've never lightened the burden of one person. They don't even know what direction you're speaking of when you say, pick that load up, don't press it down. They, they don't get what you're saying. And but for the grace of God who called us to come out of that, we could be participating in the most heinous thing ever released upon mankind other than politics and religion when they get together. Those are terrible. 1 Corinthians 11, 25 says, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which He was betrayed, took bread. And when He had given thanks, He brake it and said, Take, eat, this is My body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of Me. After the same manner also He took the cup, and when He had supped, saying, This cup is a new testament in My blood, this do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of Me. Paul then said, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till He comes. So we'll be eating the Lord's Supper until Jesus comes. Amen. Yeah, I had someone actually try to diminish the importance of eating the Lord's Supper in remembrance of Jesus until He comes with some construct they had that they preferred over Christ and Him receiving guests at His table and Him having it done in His remembrance. Now, I've been in religions where it was never in remembrance of Christ. It was always in remembrance of the one who's watching us, so we make sure they're satisfied with how we're doing it. Do you ever wonder what it would be like? And I'll share with you. It's an oddity to me, but it's very normal since I've been trained in it for over 30-something years. But when people who can't know what they're talking about are critiquing us, who might be the only person in the room that knows what he's talking about. Isn't that hilarious? What makes people so presumptive? Froggy. Ready to jump. Well, you remember they were caught to catch, never taught to teach. And you can ask all of our teachers here, bless y'all's hearts, I know what y'all are going through. <laughs> you all prepare those lessons, you go there and you work with these children, and then you have parents that just swoop down on you like that swooping eagle dad and that squawking mama. Hey, don't worry about it. It doesn't happen to me anymore, only because after a while you get enough information out there, they realize, hey, you know, we can't afford to play here because a shepherd is supposed to protect the flock from that maniacal, psychopathological antagonism. A shepherd's here to equip the people so they get on with their lives and it's under God's glory and for the good of them and for their neighbor. The shepherd's here to assure that in the assembly, while we're occupied here, we come and worship Him in spirit and truth because Jesus said the Father seeking such to worship Him. And we're here to assure that by Christ Jesus... He receives the glory, His Father, and that's in the ecclesia. Now, if that's not the highest aim and aspiration that you have, then it's an error. You're in error. But it's not a problem for me. I'm not in error. I am very happy to have revealed in the Scriptures what the interest of Christ is, and that is His Father received the glory. That's by Him in His ecclesia. Now, I don't know how much more plain it can be, but it's very confusing to people who have no heart toward their own children to bring them to Christ, no heart toward their own brothers and sisters to help build them up, no heart for the Christ who called them, came out and gave them everlasting life the moment they trusted Him for it, no heart or interest, but it's kind of ironic that people say, but are they really saved? I don't have that obligation. I mean, are you telling me somebody 
wants me to constantly adjudicate someone's spiritual status rather than stop them from exasperating the ecclesia? A shepherd wouldn't do that. I'm not preoccupied with such stilliness. I'm interested in people who want to know the truth, aren't you? I'm interested in people who have a love for the truth. I'm interested in people whose lives are so centered on Christ that not only have we, once we trust Him for an everlasting life, we came out and declared Him right by our baptism. Did you hear that? Not only did we declare Him right by our baptism, but we are fellowshipping into that gospel. Our fellowship is into the gospel which speaks only of Christ. You remember the first time you taught someone, they finally said, oh, I once didn't even know the difference between communion and the Lord's Supper. Didn't you love teaching people that? Didn't you love teaching people about what we're occupied with as a steadfast continuous in the Apostles' Doctrine, which speaks of Christ's relationship to His flock, His relationship as the head to His body, the relationship of His King to His subjects. Don't you love that? So that when we're reading it, we're built up. We're, we are encouraged and we receive that lift, if you will, that, that is, like he said, a learner's yoke where he comes alongside and he meters to us in the rate in which we can receive it. So yes, we will be continuing to eat the Lord's Supper until Jesus returns. Amen. With what better could we be occupied? With what better could we be occupied than men and brethren that I, I love sharing the testimony about this church and telling people, I said, oh no, we have men in our heads of their household. They self-examine, self-correct. They are the ones who pastor their families and they bring them to the Lord's house. These men find it an honor given to them, given to them to engage in eating the Lord's Supper and acknowledge Him as the head of their home. Christ's not the head of your home. We can't fix that here. We can't fix that here. We can teach here. But unless you take Christ home with you, guess what they keep wanting to bring back? Someone other than Christ. anti Something antichrist. Antichrist the person, antichrist the ecclesia. Anything antichrist the person, as Paul said, the person Christ. Anything other than Christ the ex ecclesia, Paul said, Ephesians 5.32. Always anti. You remember the we agonize and they anti-agonize. That's what an antagonist does. How many of you all remember, no matter what you did, you had someone wanting to make it impossible to do it? They didn't want you to be free to do it. I mean, it's almost like no matter what you did, they had some reason why you couldn't do it. Now, those are called preoccupied, not occupied. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, the Great Commission, remember he said, every authority in heaven and upon the earth has been given to me. That's with reference to me, with my interest, he said. Therefore, listen, therefore, after you all have gone... Disciple all the nations. Disciple all the nations. Do you hear that? Baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them always, continuously teaching them to be observing all things, whatsoever things I commanded you all. Command, that word there, interlay, means everything that He said, everything He taught, and everything He did in their presence. You remember it was one thing for people to say what they believe. It's another thing for people to take responsibility. The highest honor ever afforded us on this planet is to model a behavior in the ecclesia for others that are watching us. Do you hear that? Now he said that. And he said, and lo, behold, notice, take notice of this. I'll be with you until the end of the age. So Jesus is with us in this work. Jesus is the one who persuades people. When we preach the gospel, we're preaching Jesus. And Jesus is the ultimate persuader. When we preach the Moses and the prophets, that's the Father and the means by which He persuades through those prophets to draw people to His Son. So he, the Father draws people to His Son, persuading them through the testimony of the prophets. You remember in Luke 16, it says, if they're not listening, since they're not listening to Moses and the prophets, then they would not even be persuaded, though one for the rose from the dead. So why would someone, as I've noticed in the book of Romans, when we as a church went through that letter more than one time, I know this is quite interesting, when Paul talked about those who were implacable covenant breakers, and I'd watch people try to placate the implacable. Did you not learn from the lesson, I would want to ask? Did you not learn that we're not here to be exasperated by those whose only aim and purpose is to exasperate others because between their ears there's darkness, in their heart there's nothing but a stone, in their lives there's void of the Spirit of Christ? Why for them the idea to make something better for someone else is to see them as a competing situation. Why, I don't want that for that person. Well, if you don't want something for another person, you certainly don't want it for yourself. If you're not going to teach another person, it's because you're not studying for yourself. If you're studying for yourself, it's so you can teach another person as well. 
I had someone ask me, he said, why are you always... I said, well, there's people that need to know this. They want to know. They ask me things. I want to be able to tell them. Don't you want to be able to tell them? Plus, I'm interested in myself. Aren't you interested in everything that God has to say? Someone once said, a pastor once said, and he's a priest here before, he preached a revival here, uh, named Dr. Penn, and he said, you know, a lot of people get real interested in a the place they're going. You know, they get the brochure out. Hey, this is where we're going for vacation this year. And they read about it, and they get their itinerary and their schedule. He said, you'll notice some people aren't very interested about things in which they don't ultimately have a destination. That was a good, good, good observation. Amen. So we all have a commission to engage. We have people to father and people to save. Did you hear that? 1 Corinthians 4.15, Paul said, For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you have yet not many fathers. For I, that is for in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. He fathered them through the gospel. So if you have the gospel, then in Christ Jesus, through that gospel, you can father someone, see them born again. Did you hear that? 1 Corinthians 9.22, To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I have made all things to all men, that I by all means might save some. So, if Paul came to be all things to all men so that he might save some, some men, some women, some children, some families, some cities, some counties, some states, some nations, have you saved your some? Have you fathered people through the gospel? Those of us occupied until Jesus comes, that's all we do. That's all we do. What do you mean that's all we do? That's a large, substantial... Oh, well, I agree. And it's a very... Fulfilled life, by the way. It's very content rich. It is that which we would do in a particular organization where we would enrich a job assignment rather than job load. You know what job loading is? You know what it is, right? It's where you feudalize somebody who's trying to do a particular task in an organization. And the person in charge thinks, all I can do here is just run these poor people in the ground. And there used to be a saying about, uh, forget the mule, just load the cart. Amen. And that's typical Egyptianity that we learned, right? But we're not here to uh, load down people's lives. They've already got that. We're not here to say, well, I appreciate all the work and the commitment you've made and all the money you've invested and all the time you've done, but um, ta-ta, I think I've noticed something. Really, if you really did, you'd have done something about it. I know because I've done things for people all my life. And it never occurred to me that the person who went out the door and the grocery cart they had. Do you remember those days? And they walked away from their grocery cart and they left things in it. It never occurred to me to say, huh, too bad. Let me criticize them, right? No, no, no. I ran over to the car. We got there. Hey, Amen. Do you all remember that? I remember the first time this uh, downpour came. It was really sudden, right? Oh, this poor lady, she rushed into her car. She left this silly basket there. Do you know what was in it? It was a money bag. A money bag. And I raced back into the office, turned it into the office, didn't know how much was in it. You know what I'm talking about. Because if I knew how much was in it, I might be in a situation that I had no power over. Amen. Yeah. Later, the lady came in just, oh, beside herself. The office had called her. Well, what do you think the old Pharisee had done? Well, look what we got. Amen. Losers, losers, and finders, winners, or something. I don't know what they do. And it's strange that in the world, we, we, we don't criticize people. I don't remember going to a hospital and saying, you know, if you'd have just jogged more, you wouldn't be in the shape you're in right now. No, we'd go in and pray. We'd go in and talk with them. We'd help the families. Did you ever do that? I mean, have you ever been curious? We know now what the Pharisees do. And you remember, and I'll end with this, but you remember when the Pharisees, when Jesus came, the Pharisees weren't like leading the blind man around. You know, let's say you say, well, Brother Carter, I can't heal anybody. Brother Carter, I, I don't know what to do about somebody. Well, I'm talking about they weren't even helping the fella get from point A to point B. The man at the pool of Bethesda, they didn't even go over and say, now, wait a minute, let's form a line here. This man's been laying here for years. Now, let's get this done right. And what were they doing? No, they were ringing a bell on the corner. Remember, they'd blow a horn to make sure no one missed the contribution they was making, which was from the money they had taken from the people in their extortion racket. Remember that? Oh, we're so generous, we don't want you to miss it, but it's your money we stole. They would find a corner where they'd be very conspicuous so they could pray. Why, if they were in the temple, don't listen to the bleating of those temple lambs and sheep as they're being sacrificed, as we notice what God has given for us to be able to stand right before Him. Pay no attention to that. Stand there and pray thus with yourself that you're so thankful you're not like other people are. And then go ahead and classify them as extortioners, adulterers, or even as that publican. Go ahead and 
categorize people, place them down so low by lifting yourself up, and tell them you fast twice a week. Who keeps up with that anyway? Who keeps up anyway? Tell them you pay tithes of all that you possess. Well, of course you would, because the money you have to pay the tithe on, you took from the people. <laughs> what a system. What a racket. No, they weren't there helping a man at the pool of Bethesda. I mean, Jesus didn't walk up and say, oh, my, here's a Pharisee on one side and Sadducee on the other side. Well, let me help you fellows. Nothing was being done to even with a finger make life better. So when I watch people give their lives to Christ, I admire them. I'll cheer, lead, champion, resource, and come along. But you already know that. Yeah, I helped one church, and once everything was solved, they were so beside themselves because, well, we didn't know we could actually do things right. We have to find something to preoccupy ourselves with because we can't now get on with occupying ourselves with what we're here to do. Amen? Because if we occupy with what we're here to do, burdens are lifted at Calvary and exasperating, grievous burdens are taken off the backs of our fellow man. Amen? So what about the return of Jesus? We learn in the Bible that the evil servant surmised, well, he must delay his coming. As if timing's the issue. I wore a little button, if you don't remember, they used to have these little metal buttons. So I had one on at the plant I was working at and it said, look busy, Jesus is coming. So as a manager, you know, you can walk all over the place, you know where you want to, right? So I'm walking all over the place, look busy. Is everybody scratching their head? Is that the way it works? I said, apparently, <laughs> apparently. I said, when we have an audit in this company, I said, just a few days before the big high ranking people, maybe the CEO shows up, some of you get real busy to try to get things cleaned up, paint it straight. Why would we just live like that? Why don't you just keep things operating the right way? Amen. See, it's not something about timing. Say, but Ricardo, if you just tell me when Jesus is coming, I'll get my act together. That's a character problem. And someone's carrying a heavier burden because of that lack of character in you. Did you know that? I love telling the parable, a little riddle, I should say. Every time I'd be assigned anything, any responsibility, apartment, plant, whatever it was, it didn't matter. I said, there's 10 men carrying a log that weighs 1,000 pounds. And I'd say, how much does a log weigh? And they'd all go, Thousand pounds. I say, five men walk away. How much the log weigh? I say, thousand pounds. I say, well, let's go lift it. You know, no one complained anymore about the weight of the log except to the person who walked out from under it. I say, oh, don't talk to me. We're running the same number of machines, or we got the same sales, we got the same responsibilities we had yesterday. You know, we have the same world to reach in spite of all those who came along to preoccupy us with doing something less. Do you know we have the same Christ who's on His way right now as I speak? And those of us whose lives are centered now with the Christ who reigns as head of this church spiritually right now really won't have a lot of orientation necessary when He returns bodily. Amen? How's your life reflect the coming of Christ? I mean, it's no one more important. There's no one more just in his dealings when he returns, when he asks us to give an account for our stewardship, when he asks us to stand before him to see if what we did while in the body was worthless or beneficial. Amen? Beneficial first to his glory, second, and quite simultaneous to the good of our neighbor. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now so grateful for life and love and mercy. We're so thankful that we can live with the certainty of your son's return bodily, just as he said, just as your scriptures teach. We're so thankful that our lives centered on your Son can not only be centered here and now and live according to His teaches under, teachings under the reign of Him and no one less, but Father, we can look forward to His bodily reign when He sits on the throne in the city of David. He sits on that throne and He rules this world, and reigns this, over this earth. And Father, we have the high honor to reign with Him then as we do now through His churches. And Father, this great honor to participate in the ecclesia, to by faith receive everlasting life, simple trust Jesus for everlasting life and have it, to simply come present ourselves to this ecclesia, to be baptized into Christ, that is this ecclesia, then fellowship into the gospel, which is the good news of your Son, and no one less, no one else. And then to learn, to become competent, to grow up to a full measure of the stature of His Son, to self-correct, self-examine, and present ourselves at the Lord's table and break that bread. And truly do it in remembrance of You, remembrance of Your Son, Jesus, that You so loved, that You gave Him to us. He was so obedient, so faithful, even unto death. And then go out and make disciples. 
and in Christ Jesus, Father, others through the gospel, and by willingness to become all things to all men, save some. And for this high honor, the highest honor ever known on this planet, we thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.